Good afternoon. How you doing? A few people are still arriving here. I'm pleased to get to welcome you today to what will be the first in a sustained effort to examine and address something that's very, very important to me, my colleagues, many of you, which is the image of justice delivered and justice denied. It's really um, pleasing to me to get to roll out an inaugural event for a new series that the School of Social Ecology is putting on called Science to Fight Injustice. My name is Valerie Jennis. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Ecology, which is the home to two of the units that are sponsoring today's program, the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society, and the Department of Psychology and Social Behavior. It's also the home to the Center for Psychology and Law, which you'll hear more about today, under the direction of the distinguished professor, Elizabeth Loftus. That center and Professor Loftus are the host of today's events, but it's co-sponsored by some partners, and I resist using the word partners in crime in an opening like this. <laughs> um, but we have many partners that make this a reality, and I want to mention just a few of them. First of all is the School of Law at the University of California, Irvine, partner in this series and many other endeavors as well as, in this series, the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice Foundation, which is our primary sponsor for today's program. And today's program simply would not be possible without their sponsorship. This foundation has provided some brochures and other information about their services out front, and I would encourage you to please pick those up and get more familiar with the foundation. I'd like to applause, um, pause and just give this foundation a round of applause for seeing the value in what we're going to talk about today. When I was growing up, my mother used to routinely impress upon me that justice is both an abstract idea and a daily proposition. Within that, I think most people would agree that justice should be fairly and predictably delivered. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. When justice is not fairly delivered, it harms all of us. It certainly harms the people impacted by that failure to deliver on justice, and it harms entire communities. In fact, I would go as far as to say when justice is not delivered, we all suffer, directly and collaterally. Just last Friday, as I was thinking about this series, the LA Times, which I'm sure many of you read and saw, front page, above the fold, reported yet another story of justice that was not delivered, although we don't know the full story yet. It reported on a man, Frank O'Connell, who was freed after being locked up for decades for a murder that he had held from the beginning that he did not commit. Here's how the LA Times described it, and this is a quote. Frank O'Connell sat in the same Pasadena courtroom where more than a quarter of a century ago he was sentenced to life in prison for a murder he insists he did not commit. In front of him, a new judge on Friday delivered the words he had long awaited. He could go home. Behind him, his relatives sobbed with relief his lips trembling and tears in his eyes. O'Connell turned to look at his son, who was just four when a judge convicted him of gunning down a maintenance man at a Pasadena apartment complex. Nearby, O'Connell's mother blew kisses to him. Then he was embraced by one of the attorneys on a legal team that had worked for 15 years to secure his freedom. He said simply, I'm going home, as he walked out of the courtroom still cuffed. The problem in this case, as reported by the LA Times, was a problem of withheld evidence and misidentification. The LA Times reported on both sides, the prosecutorial side and the public defense side. This and so many other cases for me and for many other people raises so many questions about how we deliver justice, how we fail to deliver justice, and the consequences for when we get it right and when we get it wrong. It's within this spirit that we introduce this inaugural event for the science to fight injustice. The idea with this program is to use science, the very product produced at the University of California, to help us make good on the promise of delivering justice, to get it right. And within this series, we have a commitment to relying on research, the knowledge of practitioners, the criminal justice system, and the community coming together with the common goal of delivering justice, of getting it right. 
Today, I want to extend a special thanks to some groups in the audience who have shared with us a commitment to this particular goal. We have folks from the Orange County Public Defender's Office, the Los Angeles Public Defender's Office, the Orange County Alternative Defender's Office, and the UCI Police Department. <coughs> of course, over time as this series unfolds, we'll have more and more partners in the audience to help us deliver on the promise of justice. What we want to do here at the university is we want to provide a forum for presenting scientific information. We want to develop programs. We want to fund scholarships and activities that help examine justice and the criminal justice system more generally from police to courts to corrections. This to me is as bold a promise as it is important and timely. We're also undertaking this important, important initiative under the leadership of one of our most distinguished scholars at the University of California, Irvine, Beth Loftus. Beth Loftus, and I'll introduce her formally here in a minute, it was her idea to use what we produce, science, to do better on the delivery of justice. She had a vision for how we might bring people together and how we might partner to reach common goals, common to the system as it explains what it's doing, common to our students who have expressed interest, common to our researchers who are motivated by using knowledge to better communities and society. She had an idea for how we might do this. So this project that I'm going to describe and have been describing, and you'll hear more about tonight, is really the vision and the hard work beginning with a proposal by Professor Loftus to deliver on the promise. Now, introducing Beth is always a little daunting. Uh, one could go on and on and on, and you can see the audience fade because it's so much. So instead of watching you fade, I will tell you just a few things about our visionary leader tonight. She's a colleague and friend, that's important to me. She's a colleague and friend to many of you in the audience. She is the School of Social Ecology's most distinguished professor, member of the National Academy of Sciences and many other clubs that acknowledge the best of the best. She's the author of over 500 published papers. And I think most importantly for our purposes here tonight, she's the person who envisioned this series, who had an idea about how to put science to work to fight injustice. It's with that I really revel in introducing Professor Beth Loftus. Well, Val, thank you. So, I mean, I wasn't expecting all that. I, I'm, I'm here really to um, introduce our inaugural speaker uh, for this series. And, um, I, I wasn't. I knew that uh, Dean Janice would be um, uh, talking and thanking some people, and I wasn't sure who she would thank. So I will not be redundant and thank uh, only the CACJ. Thank you so much for your uh, financial support, and of course everyone else. But but also importantly uh, to Mickey Shaw, who uh, helped to raise the funds for this uh, inaugural series, and what we hope will be a continuing series, uh, to Patricia, uh, to Tony and Ellen, and to other staff who, who worked so hard to actually make this happen. Um, to set the stage here, I, I do want to just mention that in this country, uh, there are some 75,000 prosecutions that rely on eyewitness testimony every year in the United States. This is actually a figure that I got from one of the papers uh, written by our distinguished speaker tonight. Many of these identifications are correct, of course, but uh, and uh, the, uh, the kind of evidence is very convincing. And so you'll hear something like, I'll never forget that face as long as I live. But at least 100 years of research shows that eyewitness testimony is susceptible to error, people make mistakes, and this does have huge implications for the legal system. Uh, yesterday, I went on the website of the Innocence Project, and as of April 24th, um, there are now 298, uh, 89 cases of individuals who were convicted of crimes crimes that we now know they didn't do because DNA testing has proven that they are actually innocent. Mistaken identification, faulty memory is responsible for these errors in about three quarters of those cases. And 
this has had ramifications for people over 3,000 years, combined years uh, in prison. These innocent people have uh, spent, many of them, on death row. And this brings me to uh, our speaker, uh, Gary Wells, our inaugural speaker for this series, Science to Fight Injustice. I, I want to tell you a little bit about Gary. Gary, I think it's right you were born in Kansas, right? Okay, he was born in Kansas. I was trying to find that out. He went to college at Kansas State, and it might interest some people that he was an internationally ranked pool player, and that's how he paid for uh, his college education. He then went to graduate school uh, at Ohio State University. Um, I found out some interesting things by reading a profile of Gary in The New Yorker. Uh, and in this, this, this lovely uh, profile that was written all about Gary and Gary's work, uh, we should have sent it around. Um, one of the things that I, in fact, I, I could probably say it much better, uh, the profiler uh, describes him as a blonde, jeans and tweed wearing Midwesterner. He was a 23 year old graduate student and many students are here tonight and of course you like to know how, how people got into the area that um, uh, they're working in now. Uh, according to the profile, a letter arrived to the psych department at Ohio State uh, asking for some help, a lawyer convinced that his client was innocent and that's what really got Gary thinking uh, about uh, legal cases and the role of science in those legal cases. He went on to earn his PhD at Ohio State in 1977 and is now a distinguished professor uh, at Iowa State. And one of his, I've, I've known Gary for, for, you know, since the late 70s, uh, and one of the things about his interest is that he realized that the police are not going to be throwing out all eyewitness testimony. Uh, so he wanted to examine the aspects of the eyewitness situation that are under the control of the system, under the control of the criminal justice system. And he is quite famous for an early paper that he wrote in which he divided the various factors that, that can affect eyewitness testimony into two categories. System variables, variables that are under the influence of the system and under the control, uh, and estimator variables. And so system variables would include things like how do you structure the lineup? What kind of instructions do you give to witnesses who are going to a lineup or looking at a set of photos? Uh, do you uh, conduct those uh, procedures with the investigator knowing who the suspect is or not knowing? He focused on these system variables and one of his rationales was he wanted to figure out some ways of preventing the mistakes before they even happen. He's also known for his work on the relative judgment theory, uh, and, and it's a process that witnesses use in making identifications that sometimes leads them to astray and to make mistakes. And he has invented a number of ingenious ways of reducing relative judgments. It might interest you to know he is past president of the American Psycho Psychology Law Society. He's won distinguished contribution awards from APLS and also the American Psychological Association. He has an honorary doctorate from John Jay College. And he is one of the founding members of a, a group that put together by the US Department of Justice to develop a set of national guidelines for eyewitness evidence. <coughs> Uh, that was a group that consisted of prosecutors and defense attorneys and researchers, police officers, put together by then Attorney General Janet Reno, uh, and they produced a guide for law enforcement. And I will close this introduction by just telling you a, a little bit about what I read in terms of a profile of Gary in a wonderful book by the attorney uh, and law professor James Doyle called True Witness, which I heartily recommend to you. Um, like most people who came of age in America in the 60s, he describes Gary. Gary wanted to see justice done. He was not a radical. He had a sturdy Midwestern skepticism about movements and causes. He was a scientist who put science far above politics, but he was also one committed to the idea that psychology could play a role in improving the world. 
Wells even had a vision of how it could be done. And he's going to tell you a little bit about that vision today. So let's welcome Gary Wells, our inaugural. Sorry, that's a little bit of an inside thing there. Let me, let me just skip through some things that were going to be uh, on the front of this. Um, so uh, thank you, Beth. Uh, you know, one of the things that um, was not um, in the New Yorker article, but it's no secret, I tell people all the time that, um, that I was also greatly influenced by Beth Loftus. While I was still in graduate school and before uh, I did any of this work, um, she paved the way. She was really, I think, the first person to show that um, you can do this real world, high impact, relevant stuff with regard to uh, you know, using science um, to uh, address issues that do relate to justice um, and publish that work um, in the most rigorous uh, scientific journals. Um, and I really think that 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 is uh, a contribution that um, Beth made that has influenced uh, uh, scores and scores uh, of people. So, um, so I want to talk about using science to improve the accuracy of eyewitness identification. And by the way, I'm very happy to be on this campus because it's such a powerhouse uh, in this domain. What better place uh, with the people who are here uh, than uh, than, than this campus to uh, be uh, addressing how one uses science uh, to uh, advance uh, justice. Um, number of acknowledgments, um, uh, the Wendy and Mark Stavish endowed chair is something I hold now. Uh, I always want to thank them because uh, it's such a, a great situation for me, uh, helps uh, support me in a variety of ways. National Science Foundation that's been funding my research consistently for uh, uh, the, especially the last couple of decades. Uh, and then lots of former, uh, current former PhD students who have uh, been critical in this work. Well, we all know what a lineup is. Uh, it's really permeated um, our uh, culture. Uh, everyone is familiar with the idea um, of the police lineup. Uh, it uh, has permeated, uh, you know, you see it in movies, uh, you see it on television programs. Uh, it pops up in more cartoons. I, I have well over a hundred of these uh, kinds of cartoons. It seems like it's very easy to do lineup cartoons um, because there are so many. Uh, here we have a baseball trying to pick out, you know, what assaulted it. Um, made a little more difficult by the fact that the bat is wearing uh, a disguise. Uh, or, and you know, some of these have certain elements of twists of, of uh, sort of truth to them. You know, there is, it is the case, a very reliable finding that it's harder to recognize someone of another race than it is of your own race. Apparent, that's the cross-race effect. Apparently, according to this cartoonist, there's also a cross-species effect. Um, <clears throat> and uh, let me, and just when you start to think, uh, this is fairly, fairly recent, when you start to think that, you've seen these introductions to uh, The Simpsons. Keep your eye on this. <laughs> well, I think I could have left that last part off of it, but. This is my favorite lineup. This is, uh, an episode of Seinfeld in which, keep your eye on uh, Kramer, he was asked to be a filler in a lineup. Watch this. So he's just a filler. Um, 
But of course, there's a serious side to this. Now, of course, there's long been uh, skepticism uh, about uh, eyewitnesses um, from people both inside and outside of the legal system. Uh, Voltaire said, uh, he who has heard the same thing told by 12,000 eyewitnesses has only 12,000 probabilities, which are equal to one strong probability, which is far from certain. Um, <clears throat> I think I like that quote. I'm not sure I completely understand that quote, but I think he was expressing a certain skepticism. Uh, uh, the, the last uh, Supreme Court justice, though, to ever say anything really uh, uh, much about eyewitness identification was uh, Thurgood, Thurgood uh, Marshall, who said the annals of criminal justice are rife with instances of mistaken uh, identification. And um, uh, probably the only way he could have known at the time maybe to have read some of uh, Ron Huff's work because um, uh, it's really uh, been within more the last decade or 15 years that we've been able to come up with maybe a somewhat more definitive proof of that. Well, this is about science and justice. So I'm going to go straight into uh, the si some of the science part here and talk about the idea that, look, um, uh, uh, it, it, what does it mean how do we study something like eyewitness identification or eyewitness memory uh, scientifically? Well, this is pretty straightforward, really. And so I just want to run through this so you kind of know uh, where it's coming from in case you don't already know. But I mean, any student who's well-trained in any aspect of experimental psychology can create uh, this kind of paradigm. And what we do, of course, is we create events for unsuspecting people. And because we created the events, um, we know exactly what happened, right? Uh, we know who the perpetrator was. It's one of our people. We know anything that was said, any actions that were taken. Um, and we do this uh, then uh, over and over again for large numbers of witnesses so that we know that what we're looking at is something that has been, uh, you know, that applies to people in general, not just uh, a, a few people that we tested. We can then do things like uh, show them a lineup, and when we show them the lineup, again, the beauty or the power of this is because, as happens in science, when you take control of these variables, when you create the very phenomena that you want to study, um, we know who the perpetrator is. Again, it's one of our people. Or whether the perpetrator is even in that lineup, right? So then we can have people uh, attempt to make identification decisions, uh, we can score them for whether they're right or wrong. Uh, we can also measure other things, like how long it takes them to make the decision or the certainty with which they make their identification. So we can study what's the relation between certainty and accuracy and so on. Uh, and then within that paradigm, that basic paradigm, we can go in and begin systematically manipulating things like the nature of the witnessed event. <coughs> Uh, the characteristics of the witnesses, young, old, black, white, male, female, and so on. Instructions given to witnesses prior to viewing uh, a lineup to see what kinds of differences that might make. The type of lineup that they view. Uh, we've created alternative approaches, alternative kinds of lineups, and tested those out uh, to show what we think is uh, a better approach. Um, and the behaviors of the lineup administrator, uh, which turn out to be uh, a big issue, uh, one that's been largely hidden, uh, and uh, yet it's a, a very important one, right? So that's the basic paradigm. And pretty much anything that we want to know, uh, we can uh, then study within this kind of paradigm. And now we have, after these years, all these years, um, a quite large literature. Um, and it's uh, so large that Really, all I can do is touch on it today, but I'm going to touch on things that I think are among the most important uh, of the observations. And uh, for um, other uh, reviews uh, of the broader reviews of this literature, there's the uh, article that we published in Psychological Science in the Public Interest a few years ago, which I think is a pretty good review. Uh, Beth and I have. Uh, uh, what I think is a very good chapter, this is a second uh, version of this chapter in second edition. We did an earlier uh, version uh, that is very broad, covering uh, a broad spectrum of the uh, eyewitness domain, not just lineups, not just identification. Uh, and then um, I think that especially those who 
are in the courtroom trying to deal with these uh, cases of eyewitness identification. I think the Wells and Quinlan of Quinlivan uh, Law and Human Behavior article that we published a couple years ago is very important because it shows why, from a scientific perspective, you're going to tend to not be able to win these cases. And you're ten going to tend to not be able to win a suppression hearing because it's a because the way that the law works on it is flawed. It's not taking into consideration the nature of the science. Anyway, now eyewitness uh, identification research by applied experimental psychologists, which I guess is what I am. I was actually uh, trained as a social psychologist, but I would call myself, I guess, more an applied experimental psychologist, has now had a huge impact on the legal system. And I'm going to talk some about that later. Um, but this is not, has not been true for very long. The legal system was largely dismissive of this science uh, until, uh, uh, until really late in the 90s, early in, in uh, the 2000s. Um, and it was only after forensic DNA testing came along. In other words, we were doing all this work, we were doing this science, we were publishing this work and, uh, and, and making a case and blowing a whistle and saying there's a problem there are matters to be addressed here, but the legal system uh, was largely, uh, for the most part, uh, dismissive of it. Uh, but then, once forensic DNA testing came along in the 90s, as many of you know, uh, uh, it began to uh, change things. Um, and we began looking at these DNA exoneration cases. We published an article then in 1998 that, for example, examined the first 40 DNA exoneration cases. Um, because we ought to be interested in knowing, so these are cases where people were convicted of crimes they did not commit. Forensic DNA testing came along and proved that they uh, were, in fact, innocent. Um, and we ought to be interested in knowing, as a culture uh, and, and as, as uh, scholars of the legal system, what went wrong. Um, and <clears throat> uh, it turns out uh, most of the cases are cases like that of Kirk Bloodsworth. Kirk Bloodsworth uh, had never been in trouble with the law in his life. He served his country well uh, in the U.S. Navy. Um, he was just uh, uh, going on with his life, but he was convicted in murder, of murder and rape in uh, 1985. He was sentenced to Maryland's death chamber and spent time uh, on death row. Um, but uh, on a technicality, uh, it got reduced to a life sentence. And then the other number there, the, the slash nine, that's the number of years he served in prison until forensic DNA testing came along and proved that he was innocent. Now, what we ought to be interested in is, is what we've created here. Uh, uh, this was in the original article in the right-hand column, uh, the evidence producing the conviction. And in uh, Bloodsworth's case, five witnesses mistakenly identified him, right? Now, if you look down this column, you'll see that uh, with only a few exceptions, there's always something else, right? Like in Bloodsworth's case, self-incriminating statements. Now think about that. Self-incriminating, how can you make self-incriminating statements when you're innocent, right? But what happens is, it's the eyewitness ID that's driving this. Right? And then within the context of that, even ambiguous statements by Kirk Bloodsworth get treated as self-incriminating. Um, and so, you know, things like proximity of residence, uh, weak alibi, right? I mean, these things are, are brought in, but they don't mean anything in and of themselves. So what's driving this basically um, are, is the uh, identification evidence. Now this should not, this does not come as a surprise to a Ron Huff, who well before any of this was identifying as causes of wrongful conviction prior to DNA, uh, the, the strong role that um, mistaken eyewitnesses uh, played. But the DNA stuff somehow has a lot more definitiveness and punch, and you don't have to look at all the kinds of nuances that Ron Huff discovered about, you know, so innocent, right? And you get 
people sometimes wondering, well, you know. So the DNA became much more definitive and it moved things along pretty well. There are now, as I think uh, Beth pointed out, 289 uh, fully uh, complete exoneration cases, 219 of which are cases of mistaken eyewitness identification. Average time in prison before uh, being proven innocent, 13 years, range three months to 35 years. Many were on death row. This is a, uh, these are pictures of just 99 of those uh, 200 and some uh, mistaken eyewitness uh, identification exonerations. Um, I have had the good fortune of meeting a, a large share of these individuals, not all of them, um, but, uh, and, and certainly not, uh, for example, Timothy Cole, who was in fact, who died in prison uh, before he could be exonerated. Um, uh, but there's Kirk Bloodsworth right there that I was telling you about uh, before, right? But here's what's important, I think, to keep in mind. This can only be a small slice of the cases. A small slice. Follow, follow this with me. Because when, you know, you can talk to any uh, Innocence Project, um, and what you find is that, by the way, which are fairly new phenomena themselves, I mean, when I started off in this area, when Beth started off in this area, there were no Innocence Projects. There was no Innocence Conferences. There were no, there were people, uh, who, there were very few people who believed there were innocent people in prison. It was just amazing. But this can only be a small slice of the cases, you DNA exonerations. So and let me tell you why. So do a little bit of math in your head, and I'm gonna end up giving you some conservative statements about this even. Because when you go back to these cases, so these are people all who were convicted prior to the advent of forensic DNA testing. Um, and then, th then they appealed to various sources uh, to try to get their cases heard. Uh, and what you find is that when you go back to those cases, as any uh, Innocence Project will tell you, well, the biological evidence wasn't collected. Sorry. Oh, well, the biological evidence was not collected properly, has to be done properly, sorry, or the biological evidence was destroyed. Sorry, because after all, there were no laws in any state that required preservation of the biological evidence after conviction. Some, a few places, kept it, right? Or the biological evidence deteriorated. Heat, light, uh, our enemies, of biological evidence. It has to be stored properly. But here, or the biological evidence was lost. If you've ever been to certain evidence rooms around the country, you know that, you know, it's just a mess, right? But here's the big category. There was no biological evidence. You see, when I went through those DNA exonerations, I don't know if you noticed what the charges were. I mean, in some cases, murder, robbery, blah, 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 but there's all, there was always sexual assault involved. Now, there are, there are a few exceptions, but basically, the DNA exonerations are sexual assault cases. Why? Not because sexual assault um, victims are bad eyewitnesses. They're probably the best eyewitnesses we have in some ways. I mean, they get a much better look, longer look, and so on, closer look than in a 7-Eleven uh, robbery or whatever, but because that's where the DNA is, right? So it turns out that um, uh, only a fraction of cases, a small fraction, can be solved with DNA tests because most serious crimes do not leave behind definitive biological evidence. So for all the reasons I gave you on the previous page, most sexual assault cases there's no biological evidence to be tested because it wasn't collected, it wasn't preserved, it just deteriorated, destroyed, whatever, right? So this is a small fraction, and it's a small fraction of cases. Very small fraction because, in fact, it's rare to have any DNA-rich uh, biological trace evidence for murders, for muggings, for burglaries, drive-by shootings. How excited is this guy gonna have to be robbing the 7-Eleven to leave behind that kind of evidence, right? <laughs> Not gonna happen. So we're still very much dependent on eyewitnesses, right? And so it's important to look forward and say, how can we prevent these mistakes from being happy? 
So only a fraction of cases can be uh, solved this way. This can only be a very small slice of the cases because, in fact, we estimate that fewer than, even going forward, 5% of eyewitness cases have DNA trace evidence that could possibly uh, then trump mistaken eyewitness identification. And it takes something pretty much as definitive as DNA to trump an eyewitness. Eyewitness is so persuasive, it takes something uh, almost that persuasive to trump it. Um, now, <clears throat> there are lots of uh, reasons uh, that we can talk about and, and about, you know, why do eyewitnesses make mistakes? Why are eyewitnesses <clears throat> so um, potentially unreliable? Um, and, you know, a lot of it has to do with witnessing conditions and so on and so forth, which are not that great. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's a very unusual situation for people to be in. They have no practice at it. But um, one of the things that uh, that I described relatively early on, and, and uh, Beth Loftus uh, alluded to this, is this idea of what I call the relative judgment process. That is, when you get down to looking at what happens when witnesses view a lineup, okay? Um, in general, and it took me quite a while, lots of experiments to sort of realize what I was looking at. You know, sometimes the simple, and you'll see this is very simple, Sometimes the simplest things are the hardest things to discover, right? Because they're so simple, you're looking for something complex, and the simple thing is right in front of your eyes. So it took me a while. But basically, um, uh, the idea is, is, is this, that when eyewitnesses view a lineup, they tend to select the person who looks most like the perpetrator, or most like their memory of the perpetrator, relative to the other members of the lineup. And that's why I call it a relative judgment process. Right Now, usually when I tell people about this, it's sort of like, yeah, so what? What's wrong with that, right? Uh, and so let me tell you what's wrong with it. Let me point out that this comparison process and homing in on who looks most like him and identifying that person uh, can be problematic. So here, even though I had shown this in much more complex ways before, um, <clears throat> Uh, this is a, a, a somewhat later experiment that I think illustrates the problem with relative, the process of relative judgments and the problem with relative judgments. So what we did was we staged a crime 200 times for 200 separate witnesses, right? And then for half of them, randomly determined, uh, uh, they individually viewed this photographic lineup. By the way, most lineups are done with photographs. Um, it's relatively rare to have uh, live lineups today. Uh, and 54% were able to pick out uh, the perpetrator. Now, nothing magic about 54%, right? That number goes up or down as a function of all kinds of, of variables, how good of a view they got, how long between the time of the crime and the lineup and so on. What, what's important, as it is in general in science, are patterns. We observe patterns. And what I'm going to show you is a pattern, a very repeatable pattern. Um, so 54% um, uh, pick him out. Um, now notice down here, and I just underlined it, all witnesses were warned that the actual perpetrator might not be in the lineup. We're going to come back to that point later. It's very important to do, right? Perpe real perpetrator might not be here. And in fact, looking down the lower right-hand corner, 21% made no choice. 21% said, I don't think he's there, or I can't be sure enough to identify him, okay? Now, what we wanted to know in this experiment was, now, what happens if we take the perpetrator, for the other 100 of these witnesses, also individually tested, eliminate him from the lineup, replace him with no one, right? Where does the 54% go? Because it has to go someplace, right? These numbers have to add up to 100%. It has to go someplace. You can't pick number three. There's nobody in that slot, right? So one possibility, of course, uh, is that that 54% uh, oh, and all these witnesses were also warned that the actual perpetrator might not be there. Same instruction. One possibility is that 54% slice down here joins the 21. So now you have 75% making no ID, right? But you know that's not what happens. And you know that 
because otherwise, why am I telling you about this? And also because I told you, you know, we talked about relative judgments, right? So um, it's not 54% that slides down there. Instead, uh, in this experiment, 11% slide down there, and the dominant tendency is to go to the next best guy, right? So now his jeopardy goes up dramatically. That's relative judgment, right? And now there are a number of important, really important implications of this relative judgment process. Um, and um, despite how long this uh, has been around, we still discover new implications of it all the time. But the problem with the relative judgment process, then, is that some member of the lineup is always going to look more like the perpetrator than the remaining members of the lineup, even when the actual perpetrator is not in the lineup. Now, it, uh, you know, well, the real perpetrator is not in the lineup. Isn't that sort of a trick? Not at all. And in fact, and I'm going to come back to this point at the very end of my talk, um, there is, there's no uh, there's no law, there are no rules or whatever about whether you have to have evidence against anybody to put them in a lineup. Witnesses are viewing perpetrator absent lineups all the time. It's just a, a detective saying, you know, maybe Joe did it. Okay, put Joe in a lineup, right? Well, if Joe didn't do it, the witness is looking at a perpetrator absent lineup. Now there's jeopardy among those people in that lineup. Um, so, <clears throat> so we don't want witnesses really using uh, relative judgments uh, in, in quite this manner. But, you know, given that they do, we have to take account of it. Um, so this is from 60 Minutes. Actually, Beth was on this 60 Minutes, too. And uh, this is Leslie Stahl. And this is something that aired. It's just a little portion of it. Um, and I had spent time with Leslie Stahl going over everything that I talked to you about up to this point, talking about the great difficulty is detecting, you know, it's so difficult to detect the absence of the perpetrator, and that's a real problem. I talked about relative judgments. She's a very smart person. She understood it completely, right? And then we got to this point. So let's uh, start this. Well showed me a study in which more than 300 subjects were shown deliberately shaking videotape of a simulated crime. You look out a window and you see some suspicious behavior. What happens is we tell them later that this person that you saw right there mm -hmm. put a bomb down, that, uh, down the air shaft there. Then subjects are shown a lineup and asked to identify the bomb. That would be so hard. Very I just saw it. And uh, of course, you're particularly cautious right now. You know now, after we've talked, probably not to pick anyone. <laughs> no, no, actually, I know, I actually know who it is because yeah. if I had yeah. who is come it? up on that, I think it's this guy. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Yeah. I'm wrong. Okay, so there you go. And I'm wrong. <laughs> <always, I'm always. laughs> it's not. No. And so it, it, it's so. And you know, you know about this. You know about this. You've talked about it. So. <laughs> you, you know, one of the one of the great uh, lessons I think of scientific psychology is my own belief is that when something comes very naturally to people, it's just a part of how we process our world or whatever. Do you think we do? I think we're relative judgment processors. You can't just tell somebody to do otherwise. Sometimes you have to do something else, which I'll get to in a minute. But I want to show you now. Um, uh, here was the line. Here were the people in the lineup that she saw, and I want to point something out here. Um, here's the um, actual uh, bomber on the roof. Here's the person she picked, right? Which is the the most popular pick. Now I'm going to put them side by side here, right? All I did when I put together this lineup, which I just use as a demo, but I, is is six males, uh, you know, in their 20s, uh, white males with uh, no facial hair and short dark hair. That's it. I didn't try to find a clone. In fact, there are no clones in there. This is the closest guy. This is the one she picked. Now, why is that? Is it because they have exactly the same nose? Not even close. Oh, maybe it's the same eyes. No. Oh, the same mouth. No. 
right? And in general, it's interesting that in the DNA exoneration cases, with only a few exceptions, when you get a hit on who the real perp is, he's not a dead ringer for the guy they picked. He's not a dead ringer for the guy that the witness sat on the stand and said, I'm absolutely positive about, right? These are not, for the most part, cases of coincidental resemblance, right? They're cases of relative judgment. In other words, what happens is, well, this person looked more like him than the others in the lineup, just relative in that sense, right? Well, um, there are lots of important implications of the relative judgment process. Uh, one of them is that uh, this is why uh, it's so critical to give uh, what we call the pre-lineup admonition. That is, warning the witness, look, the real person might not be present, um, you know, uh, the correct answer might be none of these. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't take care of the relative judgment process completely. It helps, you know, in the study that I showed you before with that removal without replacement, we gave that instruction and they still made relative judgments, right? But if you don't give that instruction, it looks even worse than what I showed you. Another implication is this is really the reason why the fillers, you know, fillers in a lineup are these people who are just in there to fill it out. They fit the general description, you put them in there, you're trying to make it fair, right? The fillers in the lineup need to fit the witness's general description of the culprit. Because if the, if the, if the only person who fits that description is the person that you th are testing might have done it, and the other people don't, well then guess who's going to look more like the perpetrator relative to the others? For example, in uh, this uh, Oklahoma lineup where the witness described the perpetrator as a white male, sl uh, slight build, early 30s, dark hair just over the ears, clean shaven, about 6'2". That was the witness's description. And uh, as you can see here, um, you've got, um, that's not, whoops, that's not uh, uh, hair just over the ears, uh, that's not clean shaven, that's not clean shaven or hair over the ears. That's not hair just over the years or clean shaven. So it's between these two guys, right? And look how they left the height lines in the background at 6'2 <laughs> for this guy, right? Who was their suspect. I don't know if he did it, but he's the person certainly who got uh, identified. No DNA in this case, we'll never know for sure. But uh, now another implication of this is, um, again, the idea that, well, if, if witnesses are prone to this relative judgment process, what can we do about it? And I said before, I, I don't think you can just tell people. I mean, we've tried that. Don't do that. Um, it's just too compelling. Um, Leslie Stahl could not hold herself back from doing it even after you know, uh, uh, us talking about it for quite a while. So one of the things we did was we created the idea of a different kind of lineup called uh, the sequential lineup. And the idea of the sequential lineup is to try to reduce reliance on relative judgments. That was the theory behind the sequential lineup. And so in introducing the sequential lineup, first of all, we had to like decide, okay, and this is, was myself and one of my PhD students at the time. Um, well, what do we, you know, we need some terminology here. So uh, we had to first of all name this, which is now called the simultaneous lineup. The traditional police lineup is, is referred to as a simultaneous lineup now. Uh, whether it's done with the live lineup or photos, they're all presented simultaneously. And you recall that I'm saying that a big problem here is relative judgment. Who looks most like the perpetrator comparing one to the another and bringing it down to somebody like that, uh, which makes a witness insensitive to whether he necessarily, the real perpetrator's there or not. So the sequential lineup is a very, at one level, s simple variation. What happens is uh, you tell the witness, uh, you know, Mrs. Jones, I have a number of photos to show you. Uh, I'm going to show them to you one at a time. And you make a decision, is this the man you saw pull the trigger? Yes, no, we're not sure. So uh, the, ideally, the witness does not know how many uh, there are. But notice then, OK, uh, and I'm going to say, no, no, not him. No, all right? Now notice, and so now we're on number three. The witness could still make sort of a relative judgment. Um, well, this guy looks more like him than one or two did. But I don't know what number four is going to look like, or five, or seven. I don't even know how many you have. 
So the witnesses, the idea is the witnesses have to dig deeper, make more of an absolute decision, comparing each person to their memory, not to each other. That was the theory uh, behind it. Uh, what do we know about it? Well, you know, it's been around long enough that there have been lots of studies. And in the most recent meta-analysis, which combines all of these studies, there have been uh, 72 uh, experimental tests in labs all across uh, North America, in Europe, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, using 13,143 participant witnesses. Um, and uh, basically, you collapse all this into one large data bank and see what happens. And basically, what happens is, you know, uh, everything else is equal, and you're randomly assigning to either the sequential or the simultaneous procedure. Uh, the results, uh, based on that meta-analysis show, mistaken identifications from culprit absent lineups uh, were reduced by 22% with the sequential. Um, uh, identifications of the culprit were also reduced by about 8%. So a lesser reduction, but we're going to come back to that uh, in a little bit here uh, because there are variations in how the sequential is done. Um, many of these studies did not use backloading, and that's where the witness doesn't know how many are to be viewed. Many of these studies uh, uh, um, uh, would stop at the moment that the witness said yes. Uh, those are not the ways in which it's done in the real world, and it is done in the real world now. Um, which I'll come to. Uh, diagnosticity ratios, these are the ratios of hits to false alarms, right? You want that to be as high as possible, of course. Diagnosticity ratios are higher for sequential than simultaneous. So when you get an ID from a sequential procedure, you can more trust it, right? Um, I'm not going to show you that. These are some Bayesian uh, curves, and you don't really need that. Well, you know, in an attempt to, uh, to share, in sharing this work with um, uh, law enforcement and jurisdictions all across the country, uh, of course we've encountered uh, some pushback uh, in certain circles. Um, uh, and, and a lot of it comes from this idea that, well, real witnesses are not the same as your laboratory witnesses, as your simulated witnesses. Um, and so they're criticisms of the lab. Um, what are those criticisms? Well, they really kind of come down to about three things. One is, these are not actual witnesses, serious crimes. Real witnesses would be too cautious to make these errors, right? Um, whereas we tend to think that, you know, memory is memory, all right, but, all right, this cautiousness notion. But if that's true, then how do you account for all the DNA exoneration cases? Were these not serious uh, uh, actual witnesses, they weren't too cautious to have made those errors. Well, but we're, we're going to come back to this. Uh, these witnesses were not experiencing the stress and fear that ingrained memory. I don't know where the legal system got this idea, but the fact is that the evidence stacks up otherwise. Fear, stress, harms memory. Now, I, I think that, that uh, are the many people's intuitions is that it helps memory because, but only in one kind of sense. If, if something was really stressful, fearful, you know, big type event like that, you will never forget that it happened, right? It's not like, you know, a trivial event that you might forget that it happened. You're not going to forget that it happened. But encoding the details, ah, that's another matter. And in general, and I'm not going to review this evidence, but the evidence suggests that uh, detail encoding is worse uh, under stress and fear. Um, and then another criticism that, well, most of these uh, studies, uh, are, you're using college students. I mean, what are college students? I mean, what about real people, right? <laughs> and, you know, uh, it turns out we have used real people as well. Um, and you find something very interesting. Namely, there's no better witnesses than college students. We've never found a population that outperforms college students. College students outperform people who are older than them, outperform people who are younger than them, outperform people who are their age, who are not in college. I mean, they are the best witnesses. So if anything, you know, we're using a very adept population 
to make any kinds of uh, estimates that we're making. Nevertheless, um, uh, about four, now four and a half years ago, and this, this was a four-year study, it took us a long time to do this. This was a big undertaking, much bigger than we thought when we went into it. Uh, we decided uh, we, we have to take a variable. We took the simultaneous sequential variable uh, and test it with actual witnesses to serious crimes. Um, and we released this study uh, just this last year. Um, and um, so we call it the simultaneous for sequential field experiment. Um, and there were four participating police departments. So we're using real witnesses who did not know they were part of a study. The, the, these range from uh, 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 murder cases uh, all the way down to like simple assault cases. We're just taking witnesses as they come. The police, participating police departments were uh, Austin, Texas Police Department, the Charlotte, North Carolina Police Department, San Diego Police Department, um, and the Tucson, Arizona Police Department. Um, funding, um, I want to mention this because they were great to us, the Open uh, Society Foundation, George Soros, uh, thank you George Soros. Um, the Jet Foundation, one of the things that took so long, we started with the Jet Foundation, they were going to fund the whole thing. Turns out that um, the wealthy couple that uh, had the Jet Foundation had their money uh, in all in with Bernie Madoff. And so we got one payment from them and then that folded. But we did get a payment. So, uh, and the Laura and John Arnold Foundation uh, out of Texas that was particularly interested in the Austin site. Um, partners, uh, uh, my scientific partners were Nancy Stably and Jen Dysart. And we had other organizations as partners, and they, were, they proved to be extremely valuable uh, in this uh, endeavor. Uh, the American Judicature Society, the Police Foundation in Washington, D.C., and the Innocence Project in New York. The key characteristics of this study um, are that uh, th these police departments only use photo lineups. So we were using photo lineups. These are actual women, witnesses in their ongoing criminal investigations. Um, um, and, and this was key. Um, the, the, the lineup, the photo lineups themselves were actually administered uh, using a laptop computer. And, in a, and for the most part, self-administered by the witness. Now this is critical. We developed this software for that purpose because it turns out we dabbled some with Detectives as experimenters, right? I love detectives, they're great. But they're not great experimenters. They deviate from protocol all the time. And we could, you can't tolerate that in a scientific experiment, right? So the laptop computer has these great properties. What happens is the detective, uh, uh, the case detective loads the photos like he or she would and selects the photos, here's my suspect and blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, into a program. Um, it goes into this uh, program that we wrote um, that then uh, when the detective turns this over to the witness, um, the witness hits a button, the laptop administers the photo lineup. It gives all the instructions that assured that the instructions followed the protocol. Um, uh, all the responses that the witness makes on mouse and so on, and this is audio taped as well uh, by the computer. Uh, are automatically entered into the records, so we know we're not missing any of those records. Critical, random assignment at the very last second to simultaneous or sequential. That's important. So even though the case detective is building the lineup, they don't know if it's going to be a simultaneous or sequential lineup. And that's important because maybe, you know, sort of at some level, they might kind of build better lineups for one or the other, depending on what they think is happening. Um, Random assignment at the last second of the order. So the order gets scrambled of the photos in there. Uh, so those are very important characteristics that um, on top of that, it was all double blind. In other words, what happens is the case detective can't even be in the room. The only other person in the room with that witness on the opposite side of the laptop is a person who, even if they got around there and looked at that lineup, wouldn't know which one's the suspect, which ones are fillers. Uh, and that brings me to the last point here. 
In the real world, I mean, in the lab, we know exactly who the perpetrator is, right? So we can score accurate, inaccurate. We know, you know, in the real world, you don't, right? I mean, that's why you're doing the lineup. But if, but, but, but we, got the, we made sure that in these jurisdictions and the actual computer program itself made them uh, do it this way, you have one person who's a suspected person, right? That may or may not be the perpetrator, we just call him a suspect, right? And the other five are known innocent fillers, all right? That means if the witness picks one of them, you know they made a mistake. And if the sequential's doing the job that we claim from our lab studies, it should reduce um, filler picks, right? It should reduce, I mean, they become the proxy for a mistaken identification of a suspect, right? So that's a very important characteristic down there. And so in the computer program, you know, it either uh, comes up with, and there are all the instructions are there, and the instructions are delivered both in writing uh, and um, uh, orally with a voiceover from a female voice. Um, so if the witness picks, uh, for example, number four, and this, this is actual, this is in fact uh, one of the lineups that I have actually permission to show you, and this was out of Charlotte. But if the witness picks this person, oh, that's a mistaken ID. How do we know? Well, because that was one of the fillers, right? We know she didn't do it, right? Actually, she was in a jail cell at the time, right? So, uh, but if the witness picks this person, because that's a filler, um, then we would call that a suspect pick. We don't know if it's right or wrong for sure, but we know that it's more likely to be right than picking that filler, all right? So uh, the sequential procedure or the simultaneous procedure and so on, everything's recorded well. Let me get to the main results. And you can find this report in more detail, uh, like uh, for example, on my homepage would be an easy way to, to, to get it. Um, main results, um, well, um, so this is the percentage of witnesses identifying a suspect, a filler suspect, which may or may not be right, a filler, which we know is wrong, or making no identification. We had 497 of these lineups. Um, and what we find is that identification of the suspects basically did not differ between the simultaneous uh, and the sequential. Now, we aren't doing it exactly as it's done in the lab. We're doing it as it's done in the real world. We're doing it at, you know, because as I'll mention later, lots of jurisdictions have now changed the sequential as a function of this uh, research of this, that we've created. All of New Jersey does sequential. All of North Carolina does sequential. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, various other individual police departments all across the country, most of Wisconsin and Minnesota and so on. Boston does them. Um, uh, but, but we're not doing it exactly as it's done in the lab. We're doing it as it's done in the real world. In the lab, what happens is researchers tend to, as they go along, as soon as the witness, for example, well, in the lab, a lot of the studies aren't backloaded, so they know how many they're gonna be. In the lab, uh, they don't uh, explicitly include a not sure option, which can keep the witness going through the sequence. In the real world, you have to include that option. So as we went out there, as I went out there, began applying this in various jurisdictions, first in New Jersey, um, we had to become realistic about how it's really done. And I think the way it's done in the real world in those jurisdictions is better than what the lab literature had shown, which I think accounts for in part why identifications of the suspects are basically uh, equal here. But filler IDs, uh, that's a, that's a uh, and there's the no identification rate. That difference is not significant. That difference is statistically reliable. So it did, in fact, um, as we had thought it would, um, as we'd certainly predicted uh, on the basis of lab work, uh, reduce the identification of fillers, right? So it seems to be doing its job. Well, that's one kind, you know, this whole idea of relative judgments and everything that comes out of that, that's one very important, I think, kind of contribution of science to trying to improve the reliability of eyewitness evidence and reduce the likelihood of mistaken identifications. 
But there's something else that, uh, that I introduced uh, many years ago that I think in one respect may be the most important um, reform to be made. Um, and it just comes out really, what's, what's great about this one, I think, is that I just borrowed it from science. I didn't invent this. I didn't invent blind testing. I didn't invent the double blind testing, right? Um, blind testing. You know, for our purposes, just uh, we don't have to worry too much about the distinction between uh, single blind and double blind. Basically, we're talking about, in this context, blind testing meaning that the person administering the test does not know the condition of the person being tested. Um, like in tests of new drugs, right, the medical person who examines the subject does not know whether that subject received the the experimental drug or received a placebo, right? And technically, that's double blind. Single blind is when the patient doesn't know, right? We assume single blind with lineups. We assume that, that the detective doesn't say, uh, Mrs. Jones, I'm gonna show you a lineup to see if you can pick out number three, right? <laughs> but, um, but the standard practice, except in recently in some jurisdictions now, has been, for the case detected to be the one administer uh, the lineup, right? And so it's not double blind, right? Um, we're not talking about, by the way, intentional influence here. The purpose of uh, blind testing is to prevent unintentional influence because people are unaware when they test somebody of the ways in which they might uh, influence the witness. So what we're looking at is the following. The standard default kind of procedure is you have a detective, the detective has a suspect, thinks maybe Joe did it, um, has maybe reason to believe Joe did it, puts together, uh, let's say, a photographic lineup, um, and um, puts Joe in position three, right? And then uh, of, of some kind of uh, uh, procedure, and then uh, begins showing it, uh, sits down with the witness and shows it to the witness. And what we're concerned about are verbal and nonverbal uh, influences. Consider verbal influence. So the suspect's in position three. Put yourself in the position of the detective. You, you know that one, two, four, five, six, those are just fillers. Your suspect's number three, right? And you show this to the witness, and the witness says, um, number two, okay? What's, what's, what's natural to do under that kind of circumstance as a tester? Um, well, be sure you look at everyone. Take your time, right? And, th and that makes sense. I mean, it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, that's what people would normally do. But, but notice that if, if the suspect is in position three, and now the witness says, mm, number three, what's the reaction? Tell me about number three, right? So think about it. I mean, who's doing this identification? And, you know, when you say, now be sure you look at everyone, Basically, you're saying, get the hell off number two. It's not two, right? <laughs> Even though that's not the intent. I mean, it's not a malevolent intent here. It's just, that's how people test. We require double blind testing in science, not because we don't trust scientists, but because scientists are human. And human beings influence the people they test, right? It's just human nature. Uh, or, and this is what really got me first proposing uh, the, the double blind lineup, um, the eyewitness says nothing. This is a real case from South Carolina where um, uh, we know, according to the testimony both of the detective who took the stand and the witness, that the, that the witness looked at this photo lineup and said nothing for some period of time. We don't know how long. The detective thinks it was a really long time, right? <laughs> Um, and the witness says nothing, and at some point then, the detective says, I noticed you paused on number three. <laughs> and I, I think the witness did pause on number three. And I think the witness also paused on numbers one, two, four, <laughs> five, six. But the pause on three seemed so much longer to this detective, right? The last person you want interpreting subjectively the length of a pause is somebody who has a theory about where you ought to be pausing, right? So um, uh, even if you had a rule 
when I first came out with this stuff, the FBI um, quickly changed the, uh, their procedures because uh, it got a lot of kind of publicity at the time. Um, and they quickly uh, changed their procedures and said, um, don't say anything to the witness. And it just hand ties them. It's really a bad rule because witnesses say things that are ambiguous, right? I mean, like uh, three, but five. Like, what? You got to follow up. You got to talk to this witness. Now, if you don't know, is it three? Is it five? Is it six? I don't know. It could be one. If you're that double blind administrator, right? I don't have a problem with your saying, are you saying it's three? Right? Or are you saying it's five? In other words, have that discussion. But if you are the case detective, uh, right? And the witness says three, but five. Oh, okay, five. Good. Right? Notice how it just goes a different direction, right? So anyway, even without words, there's all kinds of pauses and leanings of displays of interest and disinterest and so on. So who should conduct the lineup? Uh, independent administrators. Someone who is not aware of which member of the lineup or the photo spread is the subject, suspect, like we did it in our field experiment that I was telling you before. And here's another reason for that. You know, eyewitness certainty, very important. How certain is the witness? How confident is the witness? We use the terms confidence and certainty interchangeably. Right? How certain is the witness? This is really important because the, 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 the certainty that the witness expresses, you know, how, how sure are you that that's the guy? Positive, right? Or uh, maybe, right? Is the primary factor determining whether or not everybody in the system, the jurors, the prosecutors, the judges, um, uh, the detective, believe that the eyewitness made an accurate identification? Jury simulations, we show that that's what's driving were you going to believe this witness? Are you going to believe that witness? That's the primary, not the only thing, but the primary thing driving those judgments. All of the witnesses in the DNA exoneration cases, absolutely positive. Totally positive on the stand. Right? So that's a, that's a big deal. Now, as I showed you before when I talked about the paradigm, we're always looking at what's the correlation between certainty and accuracy. So we've been calculating that for years and years and years. And unlike what some might think, and what some early studies actually show, there is a correlation between confidence and accuracy. It's not huge, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, but it's far less, let me put it this way, uh, it's far less than the correlation between height and gender, right? So if you take a witness's certainty and try to predict their accuracy from it, and that's what we would call a point by serial Correlate. So certainty is continuous, accuracy is either or. Uh, and you say, you know, that you, you do a lot worse job with that than you would do trying to predict whether somebody is male or female from knowing their height. Okay? If I say, here's a person who's, here's an adult, five feet, six inches tall, what do you guess, male or female? Guess female, and you're going to be right more often than you're going to be wrong. Here's an adult, five feet, ten inches tall, what do you guess, male or female? Guess male. You can be right more often than you can be wrong, but sometimes you're going to be wrong. That's a much stronger correlation than the correlation between certainty and accuracy. So it's imperfect, but it's not useless, right? The problem is that we've identified is what I call false certainty, which is where you're positive and wrong. And in particular, the creation of false certainty. In other words, it turns out false certainty isn't necessary, doesn't... Uh, a lot of false certainty doesn't just happen, right? It's actually a system variable. It's actually created by the system. Um, the key is to, uh, to understand that it, witnesses can be influenced even after they've made a choice from the lineup. So a witness picks number three, you guy you thought it was. Good, you identified the actual suspect. Perfectly legal, in many jurisdictions absolutely routine, with the exception of jurisdictions that now use double-blind procedures, um, it's kind of guaranteed that the witness is going to get feedback because you're going to react somehow, even if it's a smile, right? Just the difference between a witness picking the filler and a witness picking your suspect, just your whole, the detective's entire demeanor changes 
Witnesses are sensitive to that. They pick up on it. Good, you identify the actual subject. Yes, you got him, right? Or, and this is the case, I, I get a lot of ideas from dealing with actual cases. And this is an actual case in which the witness, what happened was the defense attorney contacted me and said, hey, I, I know that my client's innocent, but this witness is absolutely positive. We had a pretrial hearing. <laughs> okay, nice to call me now, right? But he said, so how does that happen? I said, well, you know, we don't fully understand it, but here's what you should do. When you get the witness on the stand next, because I don't think there's any cost to this, ask the witness what, if anything, because there were three detectives who administered the photo lineup tour, what, if anything, did the detectives say or do when you pointed to number three in that photo lineup? So he did. He asked her. And she said, uh, so, you know, what did the detectives say or do when you pointed to number three? And she said, they clapped. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, when he got back to me on that, I'm like, oh, man, you know. We've got to study this. Is that a problem? I mean, what does this do? And so that's what led to the creation of uh, what we now call the post identification feedback paradigm, which we first uh, we published the first bit of work on that in 1998. And it's pretty straightforward. What happens is we create uh, an event. People witness the event. Then we get a lineup identification. In the data that I'm going to show you, but I'll show you some other data here in a little bit, the data I'm going to show you, <coughs> Uh, all these witnesses are wrong, okay? Because the real perp's not in that photo lineup at all. So anybody who makes an ID, they're wrong. When they make an ID, then they're randomly assigned, basically <coughs> like the equivalent of flipping a coin, to getting confirming feedback. Good, you identified the suspect. We're not doing cartwheels, we're not applauding, right? But just a comment from the lineup minute. Good, you identified the suspect, right? or nothing in a control condition, say nothing. Then ask them questions. Take what we would call measures, what in the legal system you might think of as like testimony relevant questions about the witnessed event, about their lineup identification <clears throat> um, uh, that occur after the identification and then after they either get feedback or don't get feedback. Questions like how certain were you at the time of your identification, they identified the real gunman. Now remember, at the time of their identification, they hadn't gotten any feedback, right? So it shouldn't, there shouldn't be any difference between those who got feedback and not in terms of how they answer that question, right? Um, uh, how good of a, so uh, at the time of the identification, how good of a view did you have of the gunman? How close were you paying attention to the gunman and so on, right? There shouldn't be any differences as a function of feedback, at least at some level, right? Um, but, of course, that's not what we find, and uh, what I'm going to show you here, this is kind of an unusual uh, way of displaying data, but I think very forensically relevant. Uh, this is the percentage of witnesses who score at the extreme. So this is the percentage of witnesses who say, I was positive or nearly positive all along, I had a great view, I could make out details of the face uh, quite well, and so on. Right? Now, so in the control condition, um, what happens is, we're getting, in this uh, initial study, about 12 or 13, 12%, 12 I guess that is probably, uh, of, the witness, uh, of the witnesses uh, saying that they were positive or nearly positive in their identification. Um, we don't, that's false certainty, because they're all wrong, remember? We don't know where that came from exactly, right? Um, only about 2% are saying they could make out, uh, say they had a good view, which is good, because we gave them a lousy view, right? Um, and, but what how about the confirming condition? So these are really the same witnesses, and the only difference is after they make their mistaken ID, just a comment, you know, good, you identified the suspect, right? Now what happens is uh, over 45% say, I was positive or nearly positive all along, right? Uh, over 25% say they had a great view. So this is a reconstruction uh, of their, of their uh, uh, cognitive uh, uh, processes at the time. Um, so um, this is the, the, the full 46% or whatever here. That's all false confidence because they're all wrong, but they're all saying they were positive, right? Uh, this portion is manufactured false confidence. Manufactured. 
It was, didn't come natural to them to have that false confidence. It came from the comment of the lineup administrator, right? Um, why does this happen? Um, well, uh, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but our original conception, which hasn't changed much, it's changed some since then, is that people do not form online memory traces for these things. How much, you know, what their attention was, you know, what their view was, how certain they were, and so on. They're not really forming any memorial traces of that at the time, right? So what happens is when they get asked that question later, they construct the answer, right, based on inferences. Well, I was right, so I was probably certain, right? Or I was right, so I probably had a good view, right? So it's... Uh, a backward uh, kind of thing. Um, there are lots of reasons why we think that kind of interpretation is correct. One is that we've shown that um, if you have witnesses think privately, they're not coming out and publicly saying anything, just privately about their certainty, their attention, and their view. After they've made their ID, but before they get any feedback, right, it largely eliminates the feedback effect. Right? Why? Because now they have a trace. Now they have a trace of what they thought before they got feedback. Right? So that's consistent with our interpretation. Um, oh, that's just kind of a... Uh, uh, also uh, consistent with that kind of interpretation is, is showing that witnesses cannot really accurately report on whether feedback influenced them. So if you ask them, is it possible that how you answered the question about certainty um, was influenced by what you were told about whether you picked the suspect or not. <clears throat> Most witnesses say no, but enough of them say yes that we can look at them as a group, right? Now, on the question of attention and view, virtually all witnesses say no. Couldn't have affected me on that. So, but on, uh, on certainty, you, you will get um, reasonable percentages saying, yeah, that could have affected me. And so we break those out. Uh, in this study, we gave, though, uh, some of them confirming feedback and some of them disconfirming feedback. Okay, so some of them are told, oh, that wasn't the suspect. Some of them are told that was the suspect, right, uh, depending on how the coin flip came out. And um, so among those who said feedback influenced them, and you look, in this case, this is certainty. Um, uh, what you find is that, indeed, it did, right? And among those who said, which is the vast majority, who say feedback did not influence me, it also influenced them, right? So in other words, they don't really have an ability to know whether it influenced them or not, right? So that's consistent with this idea that they're not forming online traces at the time. Actually, our more recent interpretation is that, which is a safer interpretation, is we don't know if they're forming online traces or not. For sure, what we seem to be observing, though, is at the very least, whatever trace might exist is not, does not seem to be accessible. So maybe there's a trace, maybe they form online traces, but it's just you can't, act, they can't cognitively access it. Why does the why does the post notification feedback effect matter, right? These, this is a, a Laura Smallars, um, uh, one of my PhD students right now, <clears throat> was the lead on this. Um, these data that I'm gonna show you are so fresh uh, that they still have that new data smell to them. <clears throat> um, whatever that might be. And this just shows you how, you know, sometimes, sometimes you've got nothing better to do late at night than make a PowerPoint slide that entertained you for some reason. I can't even remember how, why it entertained me. So what we did was, um, uh, the, the, you'll recognize sort of the standard positive navigation feedback paradigm where we create an event, uh, and then we get lineup identification. But in this case, um, Half the witnesses are right and half are wrong. And we just basically create that accurate and inaccurate experience um, by manipulating whether the target is in fact present so that 
we can take people who are right uh, or the uh, or the target is absent, and then we take people who made IDs there, they're wrong. So we're manipulating that. So we're going to look at both target present, uh, I mean accurate and mistaken eyewitnesses, who then get feedback or not. They either get confirming feedback or they get no feedback, right? And then uh, what happens is we take uh, them afterward, after they've made, uh, they've made their identification and <clears throat> have gotten feedback, and they get uh, cross-examined. They give testimony. And then we do high-def video of their testimony, right? Um, and so we have 112 of those, uh, 66 of which were accurate, 66 of which were mistaken, right? And then we have uh, uh, various people view these uh, and judge and try to decide, determine, was this witness accurate or inaccurate? Did this witness make an accurate identification or a mistaken identification? Beth, you'll, you'll recognize this from the old paradigm that I did back in the uh, late 70s and, and early 80s. Um, and uh, so uh, what do you find? Well, um, uh, so this is the percentages of uh, these observers of these videotapes who believed the witness to be accurate, right? Um, uh, in the no feedback condition, uh, what happens is they believe uh, the, the, the accurate witnesses 64% of the time, right? Uh, they believe the inaccurate witnesses 37% of the time. This is very important. Uh, that is the, an index of their ability to classify the witnesses either having been accurate or inaccurate, okay? So they're not at chance by, by far, right? But it's still pretty lousy performance since, you know, ideally this should be 100% and this should be zero, right? They should be believing all the accurate witnesses and disbelieving all the inaccurate witnesses. And of course, that's too much to ask, but I mean, they are performing. But what happens now with the confirming feedback? So this is accurate witnesses and inaccurate witnesses. The same, uh, you know, uh, randomly assigned, they got the, the, the confirming feedback. Now what happens? They can't tell the difference. They all look like accurate witnesses to them, right? So uh, here we have no difference, uh, and that's why this feedback effect is important. It just masks people's ability to tell who's accurate and who's inaccurate. You hear this from defense attorneys all the time, right? Like, why is it that every witness I, every case I have, no matter how shaky that I witness conditions are, they're always positive? Well, because they've gotten feedback, right? And you're not gonna be able to see these uh, inaccurate witnesses because um, they're, they're, they're already sort of prepped. And so this is, this is like a prep effect in a sense, right? Now, um, um, Beth mentioned the system variable estimator variable. I mean, if you take all these things that can, that can uh, influence eyewitness identification, and this is not a full list, but, and you draw this line through here, right? Above that line, these would be estimator variables. Below that line, these would be system variables. And I'm pointing uh, this out for a reason. So these are estimators and these are system, right? Uh, there, there are things like post-event information. Uh, 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 Beth's pioneering work in that area that can be estimator variables and can be system variables, right? Um, but, um, uh, uh, what we've been trying to do is take what we know about system variables, what I've been trying to do, and sharing that with the legal system, sharing that with law enforcement uh, and others across the country, policymakers, legislators in some cases, uh, and trying to basically improve the accuracy of eyewitness identification by dealing with these uh, system variables, the kinds of things uh, that we've been talking about. And so what do we have? We have 
basically a, a list, uh, you know, kind of our short list uh, of about five reforms. There are more. Five reforms get us in the door. Then we can, uh, once they start making the reforms, we can say, well, you also should do this and you also should do this. But you always got to, you can't go beyond five in terms of anything that you're marketing to anybody on anything, right? Um, properly selected fillers, a lot of work on what is a proper filler. Uh, Pre-lineup admonition that we talked about, double blind lineups that we talked about, uh, the sequential lineup, and importantly, relating to my last the part here about uh, confidence inflation, certainty inflation that comes from feedback, the double blind administrator takes a statement from the witness, this is proper procedure now, at the time of the identification. That is a matter of record. Because once that witness, even with a double blind administrator, leaves that room, they're going to learn. Did you pick a filler? Did you pick the suspect? We need to know from them what their certainty is before they learn anything more. And so that is a central reform, right? Um, lots of jurisdictions have made these reforms. Uh, New Jersey now, all of North Carolina and Ohio, Wisconsin, Florida is making the transition as we speak and <clears throat> should be complete by the end of this year. Texas, the same, should be complete by the end of this year. Connecticut uh, uh, as well. Cities and counties, Boston, Minneapolis, Denver, Santa Clara County, California, one of the first to adopt all these reforms. Uh, Dallas, uh, uh, Virginia Beach, Baltimore, an estimated 1,500 now law enforcement uh, agencies uh, in various states um, have adopted these reforms. So it's a success story. But I want to come back, and so this is my final, this, this will be my final set of observations. <laughs> Loft is like, good. <laughs> um, we want to leave time for questions. Yeah. Uh, are matters worse than we thought? I, I, you know, when the field study came out last year, it hit like 400 newspapers, including the New York Times, and everybody did the same story. And, you know, I, which shouldn't surprise you because they all borrow from each other, right? But they, they, they kind of missed something that I want to highlight to you. When I showed you this slide before, right, and I, the, what they always talked about, what they were concerned with was, oh, look at that, yeah, identification of fillers, identification of these innocent people were reduced with that procedure. But it's kind of a force for the trees. Um, uh, what I want to point out is that, look, let's take a look at this, like if we take, just ignore the no identifications for now, where they didn't make any kind of identification, and say, well, of the times in which they did make an identification, right, um, what percentage were of the suspect? Uh, well, with the simultaneous 58.5, right? So you see where that's coming from, and we can do it uh, over here for the sequential as well. And, and so let's look at this, which was in the paper that we released, but, um, but um, media types didn't pay much attention to it. And I want you to look over here. Look, four out of every 10 times witnesses identified somebody from a simultaneous lineup, they're wrong. Four out of 10. Even with the sequential, which does better, Three out of every 10 times they identify somebody, they're wrong. And these are self-selected witnesses. Witnesses say, yeah, I think I can pick the guy out, right? These are witnesses who most of them don't even attempt an ID. Among those who then do, right, real cases, real witnesses, um, I think that's horrible performance. If we got that in the lab, we would... What would we do, Beth? We'd like, ah, yeah, you got to give them a better, you got to do something, yeah, bring that performance up, right? Because we have some control in the lab. It would just be such poor performance to say, oh, no, you got to do better than that, right? Um, that's terrible performance, but that's real witness performance. And this is very important. This is the first blind study of real eyewitnesses with real lineups in which you make sure that you record everything, right? Because in the real world, what happens is these filler IDs tend to get buried, right? Um, so 
we did all of the best procedures in this field study, right? We had double blind, it was sequential, cautionary instructions, warning the perpetrator might be present, good line of composition with our fillers, pristine records, and despite that, even with our best procedure of the sequential, three out of 10 who make an ID are wrong, right? What does that tell us? Well, um, and the real rate of mistaken IDs has to be higher than that, because remember, we're assuming that all the suspect picks are accurate? Um, no. In fact, we already can point to some, many of the specific cases and show that they're not. Um, so it raises an important question, for me at least. Have we simply found a limit to the system variables in terms of how much they can clean up the eyewitness identification problem? I mean, if we're still getting three out of 10 are making a mistake when they make an ID with our best system variables, uh, uh, there are lots of possibilities. Uh, I'm going to just skip through these uh, about why performance is so low. Um, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to skip through this on the in the interest of time. Um, but here's the message I think that comes from that. Even with reforms in place, unless or until better performance can be shown. In other words, look, this is what our science tells us. So unless or better performance can be shown, uh, post-identification scrutiny needs to be more strongly developed and practiced. Right? We need to be more skeptical and we need to find better uh, methods of scrutinizing this. One possibility, shift the admission, of bur the, the, the admission burden to the prosecution. Right now what happens is you can never get these things suppressed. No matter how egregious, no matter how bad the eyewitness conditions, you can never get it suppressed. Because the defense has to prove that it's unreliable, which is a very high burden, especially in light of uh, Manson versus Braithwaite and the kinds of procedures that you have to use. So one possibility is, why not make the prosecution prove that it's reliable to get it in, instead of the defense having to prove that it's unreliable to keep it out, right? That's one possibility. Wider use of expert testimony, uh, maybe uh, call for here as well, uh, or uh, better instructions to juries uh, that are directive uh, in nature and informed by science. Jury instructions generally haven't worked very well, but they're so weak. I mean, instead of saying, you can consider blah, 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 blah. What about a, a, an instruction that says, you will consider this and this and this and point to uh, key things instead of, uh, you know, consider this if you want. Um, that's the direction that jury instruction work is uh, headed. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>